In this video, I want to talk a little more about how capacitors work, and in particular how energy works in relationship to capacitors. So one detail about real capacitors that we left out with regard to our idealized capacitor in the last video is that we can actually make capacitors work a little better with a certain trick that we can do. So the picture I drew last time of a capacitor looked like this. And we had these two parallel plates with equal and opposite charges on each plate. So I had some charge here, an amount plus Q, and then on the other plate I needed to have an amount negative Q, like so. And um, based on that relationship, there was some electric field between the plates. So I could draw an electric field that looks like this. Okay, and I have this electric field between the plates. Well, it turns out that we can actually make the electric field stronger by putting some material other than empty space between the plates. So um, typically we use an insulator for this purpose. And what happens if we place an insulator in between the plates, and I'll draw the insulator in red, is imagine that um, if we think back to the atomic model for um, materials, the charges within the insulator are going to want to separate. So the electron clouds will kind of build up a little bit, the negative sides on the side close to the positive charge, like this. And we'll have positive charges want to build up on this side, like that. Okay, so what that means is there's actually going to be an electric field from the insulator that's pointing in the opposite direction as the one that we originally had constructed from the plates. Okay, so there's some electric field canceling from the um, insulator. Okay, so because that happens, if I write down the relationship that I had, which was that um, Q equals C delta V, well, if I have a weaker electric field than my delta V is actually going to be smaller. Okay, but if I have the same amount of charge, then that means in order for this equation to be true, the capacitance has to be bigger. So the, the capacitance actually increases if we put a, an insulator, or as we say in this instance, a dielectric. Remember, dielectric is just a different word for an insulator. Um, so if we put a dielectric um, in the capacitor. Um, and it turns out, for practical purposes, that's a really good idea anyway, because it's hard to keep the plates from accidentally touching unless you put something between them. So this also um, just happens to be a useful way to build capacitors in the first place. All right, so the way that we handle that actually is in the formula for capacitance, what we had before was that the capacitance is equal to epsilon naught A over D. And we called epsilon naught the permittivity of free space. Um, and essentially the way you can think about that name is that epsilon naught tells you how much empty space allows, uh, how much it permits an electric field to form around charges. Okay, so what we can do if we have not empty space but some material is we can have some epsilon that is the permittivity of some material. So it could be the permittivity of 
for example, glass or plastic or even paper is sometimes used. Um, it's just the permittivity of some material. So in principle, you could look these up on Wikipedia or in a book of um, physical constants. This is something you can measure. It's just a number. Okay. Um, and the relationship between these is sometimes expressed as epsilon is some number k times epsilon naught. Um, in fact, this little k is not even a k. It's actually a Greek letter kappa. But basically, it's just a short k. So if you have kind of the line like this, and here's your dotted line in the middle, and you write a normal k like this, a kappa is short. It's like a small capital K like this. Um, sometimes people write kappas in slightly different ways. So I've seen people do, instead of that, um, a symbol, kind of a squiggle like this. Um, so if you see that, sometimes people use that as well. But I just do a, a small capital K. All right, so in this case, kappa is called the dielectric constant. And that's just a measure of how much better at um, permitting electric fields to form the uh, material is than the free space. Okay, so um, basically in any equation then we can take our epsilon naught and replace it with kappa epsilon naught if we have some material other than empty space. So we could actually do that with the charged rods and with the um, spherical charges and so on. Um, if they were submerged in say oil, you just use the permittivity of oil and then plug that in instead. Okay, so with that new addition, um, we have this relationship now that Q equals C times delta V. Okay, and if I redraw my capacitors like this, well, if I have some potential difference between these plates and I have some charges between the plates, I can actually figure out how much potential energy they have. All right, and there's a, a bit of a trick to figuring out um, how much energy there is altogether, and let me kind of walk you through that. So how much energy is there? Okay, and I put that in quotes because it's kind of a weird question, but um, I think once you see the derivation, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Okay, so if I imagine that I start out with plates that have no charge on them, um, then there's no energy, okay? So that isn't too surprising. But let's say that I move a positive charge from this lower plate up to these, this upper plate. Okay, so if I do that, then I'll have a little bit of positive charge here and a little bit of negative charge here, okay? Because the amount of charge still adds up to zero. Um, now, that was actually something I could do for free because there was no existing electric potential. There was no active charge nearby that was producing a potential that I had to fight against. So this first charge can just move for free. Um, once I've moved that charge though, then I've got some electric field between the plates. And it's pretty weak because I only have a little bit of positive charge here and a little negative charge here. So if I then go and move another positive charge from this plate up to here, well, now I have a little bit of positive charge and I've left a little negative charge behind. But this time, I've had a small amount of electric field I had to fight against. Okay, so for that charge, the amount of um, change in energy that I had to do, so change in U, is equal to whatever that amount of charge was times the potential difference. And this was really small potential difference because I only had a little bit of charge already here. So once I've moved that charge, now I've got more electric field between the plates because I have more charges build up. Okay, so if I do that again and I move another charge, well, this one I have to do a lot more work on to get the charge to move because there's a lot more electric field. 
Okay, so now I'm going to have a much bigger change in energy. And if I do that again, then I'm going to have to do even more work to move the next charge, which is going to create even more electric field. And finally, for the last one, I'm going to have to basically fight against the entire electric field of all of the charges in order to move that last charge. Okay, so for the first one, delta U is approximately zero. For the last one, delta U is approximately equal to Q times delta V final. Okay, because I started out with almost no potential and then ended up with a huge potential difference. Um, and I want to um, figure out for the, oh goodness, um, <coughs> I want to figure out for this case um, exactly how much total um, energy I needed to put in in order to separate all of the charges. Okay, well, if I kind of make a graph here for the amount of charge that I've moved and the delta V, well, I know that as I move more charge, I'll have more potential difference between the plates. And it's proportional. So the more charge I move, the more potential there is. And so if I want to figure out sort of for an average case, like here I have my final potential, here I had zero. For this kind of average case, I've got essentially an average amount of charge. Okay, so my total then is going to be that. Since I start out with zero and end up with delta V final, and I want to know for the total how much I had to do, I can kind of think of the average amount of potential difference that I had to move the charge through. So the total amount of energy that I have to put in in order to put the charge on the capacitor is going to be one half times Q times the final delta V. Okay, and the reasoning for this again is I moved all the charge, but on average I had half the potential difference. I started out with none, at the end I had the total amount, um, and so this is the amount of energy I need to put in. Well, that's fine, but I have a relationship actually already between Q and delta V. So if I put in that the amount of charge is Q equals C times delta V, and I plug that in, then I've got an amount of energy, delta U is one half C times delta V squared. So I can replace this in such a way that all I need to know is the potential difference and I know how much energy is on the capacitor. Um, if I wanted, I could derive a similar expression where I eliminated the delta V and I only had Q's in there. Um, it would look really similar. The um, constant would be a little bit different. Okay, so this is another case where we have an energy that looks like one half something something squared. Um, that's a really common situation to have for situations like this because we're building up something that starts out really small and then gets a lot harder as we go and then we end up with sort of an average value in between. Okay, but we can actually do some interesting things with this expression for the energy. Okay, so if I take the energy in a capacitor, so U for a capacitor, and I call that one half C delta V squared. Okay, and I dropped the delta U because if I assume I started with no energy, then the amount of energy to charge the capacitor is just that amount. Well, I'm actually going to plug in my expression for C. So C is going to equal kappa epsilon naught A over D. And I'm also going to plug in delta V is my electric field times the distance between the plates. Okay, so those are the things that we derived before. So if I do that, I'm just going to plug those things in. I have one half kappa epsilon naught A over D times E D all squared. Okay, and if I simplify this down, I've got D squared on top and D in the denominator, so I'll be left with 1d at the end. So I've got 1 half times kappa 
epsilon naught a d times e squared. Okay. Um, so this is kind of interesting. I can write the energy stored in the capacitor in terms of the electric field and then stuff that is just physical properties of the capacitor. So that's really kind of weird. And I can make this even weirder. So if I observe that the area of the plates times the distance between the plates is actually just the volume inside the capacitor. Sorry, volume of the capacitor. Um, then I can rewrite this so that I have energy per volume so this is sort of an energy density, and I'll call this lowercase u. And what that is equal to is one half kappa epsilon naught, these are just constants, times e squared. And it turns out that this formula actually works for things other than capacitors as well. So even though we normally think of um, energy as being this you know, quantity that's conserved and has these properties that we studied before. Um, and the electric field is sort of this mathematical construct that made it a little easier to think about electricity. This expression actually tells us that the amount of electric field in some space actually represents some energy. So if I take that electric field and I square it and multiply it by some constants, um, that tells me something about energy being stored in that space. So the takeaway from this is we can think of the energy as being related to charges separated by some potential. That's sort of the normal way to think about it, the way that we derived these quantities. But we can also think about it as um, being related to the electric field squared. So if I have the electric field squared, like that tells me that, it, that the, in that region of space, there's some energy that's stored in that structure. That disturbance in space is not just a mathematical construct, but it's actually storing some energy. And that will end up being useful later when we study light because light carries energy and light doesn't have any charges, but it does have electric fields. So um, thinking about it this way will give us the correct values for the energy in that case.